What we're going to talk about today is the neurological assessment, quantification, and documentation of today's chiropractic patient. Because realistically, you know, our patients uh, have neurological challenges, and that's what we're going to talk about. So before I begin, just a couple of disclosures. Uh, my sponsors for me to be here, my clinic, Plasticity Centers in Orlando, and we've got one in Atlanta, and we also have one in Denver, uh, and the Carrick Institute uh, for Continuing Education, they're our sponsors for being here. So I just want to take a second and thank them for allowing me to be here. Um, and just so you know who I am, my name is uh, Matt Antonucci, and I've got a whole lot of letters after my name. Don't worry about that. That just means I spent a lot of time sitting in the same seat that you're sitting in trying to learn more about how I can help my patients better. Um, I am an associate uh, professor of clinical neuroscience for the Carrick Institute, president co-founder of Plasticity Brain Centers, uh, vice president of ACA Council of Neurology, president of the American Board of Brain Injury and Rehabilitation, a board member for the American Board of Chiropractic Specialties, and also a task force member for the Federation of Chiropractic Licensing Board. So, I love chiropractic, okay? Let's just start there. I commit myself to chiropractic. I've got five kids and a family, and when I'm not with them, I'm either seeing patients, if I'm not seeing with patients, I'm working for you. Because I believe in this profession so much, and I believe that there's so much potential in chiropractic that it's my life. And like, it's a life for a lot of you guys. A lot of you, when you go home every single day, it's not just like, okay, done with patients, I'm done with chiropractic. You guys live the chiropractic lifestyle, and you do things to help advance chiropractic. So that's why I'm on stage today, to help advance chiropractic. So we have a couple of objectives. We're gonna be here for two hours talking about documentation, but realistically, we're not gonna tell you how to do your notes. Really great story, one of my best friends, he's a plastic surgeon. And um, I love, once in a while, I'll scrub in a case with him. He does all sorts of different stuff. It's just nice to see something different, right? Somebody else's art form. He comes into the clinic and hangs out with me. He actually had a background in neuroscience uh, when he was an undergrad. And then he ended up going to medical school. And in medical school, he found in love with, fell in love with surgery, then plastic surgery. Um, but long story short, Mauricio would do a four-hour case. He gets on a phone inside the lobby, and he dials a phone number, and he dictates the entire case that he just did to this dictation service faster than I could ever understand. And I was like, how is somebody going to be able to transcribe it? He goes, oh, don't worry about it. They'll slow it down. We don't need help on putting our notes together. What we do need help on doing is documenting things that exist inside of our patients, whether that be orthopedic, whether that be neurological, whether it be chiropractic. But I would make the safe assumption that you guys all know how to document chiropractic services. Fair enough? So let's talk about something different. Let's talk about documentation as far as it applies to neurological uh, status or neurological integrity. So in hour one, we're gonna identify chiropractic's role in neurological wellness and performance. We're gonna uh, take the assessment of balance, uh, document the uh, assessment of balance using the BESS system or the BESS test, balance error scoring system. Some of you may be familiar with this. It is pervasive throughout the physical therapy world, um, but we're not taught that in chiropractic. Uh, yesterday, I was up here on stage and we did a, um, a little 10, 10 to 12 minute uh, piece on medical errors, and we talked about the M-BEST test, the Modified Balance Error Scoring System. Today, we're gonna talk about the Full Balance Error Scoring System, kind of teach you how to do it, give you some tools that'll allow you to uh, be able to do it in your practice. Uh, in the second hour, we're going to look at a couple cognitive assessments. We're going to look at uh, what's not up there is oculomotor function. Uh, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at cognitive function using something called the Luria three-step test. And then we're also going to look at something called the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Tool. So these things are going to allow you to assess your patients on a, on a level, hopefully, that you haven't before. And now my goal is for the next five or ten minutes to inspire you why you should do this not tell you to do it, this, and there's no rules and there's no laws that say, hey, you have to document neurological function. I'd love to inspire you to say, you know what? I want to learn a little bit more about this. I want to look into my patient's neurological integrity and, and assess it. So why assess neurological function? So worldwide, neurological disorders are the leading, leading, the number one cause of daily adjusted life years. Yesterday we talked about this metric in my 10 minute lecture. Epidemiology looks at every condition and says, with this condition, whether it's flu, whether it's COVID, whether it's falls, whatever it is, how many years of your life do you lose as a consequence of having this condition? 
and they add them all together to get the total effect of that condition. So 276 million years of life are lost every year from neurological disorders. It's the second leading cause of death with 9 million people a year dying from neurological disorders. From 1990 to 2016, neurological related deaths increased almost 40%. That's huge. In 15 years or 16 years, a 40% increase in neurological deaths. People's nervous systems are not getting healthier. It's quite the opposite. And if you're just like walking around the world saying, hey, all I do is I put bones into place, or all I do is prescribe antibiotics, or all I do is stretch and strengthen, we're missing a lot. We're really missing a lot. Neurological disorders continue to be the leading cause of disability worldwide. And their contribution to the overall burden of health is consistently increasing. So the bottom of the, whenever I, I state something, I try to give you a source. These are not my words, guys. I'm not that smart. Um, I find people that are smarter than me and try to find out and learn from them. So here's a paper from Fegan in 20, uh, 2016. The PubMed ID is on there. So if you want to read this paper, all you got to do is jot down that PubMed ID. You go to PubMed.com and you type in that ID and the full article will come up for you. So you guys can read a little bit more about these, uh, these different papers that I cite. Estimated prevalence, it's estimated that one billion people in the world have a neurological condition. That's one in every six people. So right now we have probably about, I don't know, I'd probably say 100, 125 people in this room. One out of every six of you, so 25 people in this room have a neurological condition. Now you're probably saying, ah, oh, you know, looking around the room, I don't see anybody shaking, I don't see anybody paralyzed, I don't see anybody with a tick, I don't see anybody, you know, not being able to speak. But keep in mind that there's more than just the obvious neurological disorders, headaches. Headaches is, are considered a neurological disorder. Migraines. Migraines are considered a neurological disorder. Uh, concussion. Concussion is considered a neurological disorder. There are so many different disorders that are considered. So without maybe, uh, without maybe uh, answering one of these questions, Think about how many of us have ever had a headache. You can kind of see how one in six becomes a reality, right? How many neurological patients do you have? So how do we figure out this question? In your mind, think about how many patients you have. Do you have 50 patients? Do you have 100 patients? Do you have 1,000 patients? Have you been in practice for 40 years? Have you seen 10,000 patients? One in every six of those patients has or had a neurological condition, and maybe you didn't even know it. What this, this is from a, a paper that I actually don't have the reference for just because it wouldn't fit on the screen and I'd be able to see it. Um, what this is here is just my clickers, not blowing up like it's supposed to. It's supposed to magnify everything so you can see it, but it's not working. Um, this shows us on the left-hand column the neurological condition. On the top axis, it shows us where in the world it is and its ranking as far as it goes. And what you'll see is that top line shows that stroke Number one, except for Australia and Western Europe, number one cause of neurological disorder, followed by migraine, followed by Alzheimer's and dementia, usually followed by some sort of a spinal cord injury or brain injury, um, and then um, some other different types of conditions. Parkinson's disease falls in the top 10, but not uh, in the high top 10. So you see stroke, migraine, uh, and neurological degeneration are the real big causes of neurological death and neurological injury around the world. So where does chiropractic even fit into this? Well, here's my pitch to you guys. 44% of Americans will not go to their doctor when they're sick. Now, their doctor, right? Meaning they won't go to the medical doctor when they're sick. 44% 40, of people, those patients are coming to you. Most likely they're coming to you not to get sick and sometimes they'll come to you saying, you know what, I'm not going to them because I don't want pills pushed down my throat. I want you to fix my cause. So when we start looking at some of these statistics, remember you're actually seeing more than this calculation shows us. So it's estimated that 9% of the population sees a chiropractor each year, so that's 30 million people. If we just go with the 30 million people, you all, we all, are seeing five million patients a year with neurological conditions, not counting the neurological conditions that chiropractic patients or chiropractic symptoms come for. So this is saying that means that 
Five million people will come to you that have a stroke. Five million people that will come to you with migraines. Five million people will come to you with potentially uh, Alzheimer's or dementia. However, chronic pain is a neurological condition. Fibromyalgia is a neurological condition. Neck pain, neck tightness is a neurological condition. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. Actually, let's talk about it now for a second. We've got time. Do muscles contract on their own? What causes a muscle to contract? Let's get technical. It's an alpha motor neuron, right? We could just say nerve, right? But let's get technical, alpha motor neuron. What causes an alpha motor neuron to depo depo depolarize? Where is the synapse on an alpha motor neuron? Is it in the brain? No, it's in the spinal cord, right? And then where does that spinal cord synapse come from? Well, it comes from the brain. So if somebody wakes up in the morning and their neck is really tight and you say, oh, you must have slept wrong. Well, how many nights did that person sleep and how can they do it wrong, right? So the brain, for some reason, is telling that neck muscle to contract when it's not supposed to be contracting. That's a neurological problem. So now, all of a sudden, we have a completely different context that blows all of these statistics out of the water. So how many chiropractic patients actually have neurological problems? 100%. Every one of your patients has a neurological challenge. It's just a matter of whether you can see it and measure it and do something about it. And the last thing I'm here to assure you for that last thing, you are able to do something about nearly every neurological condition. If you can't cure the condition, you can at least make the quality of life better for that patient with that neurological condition. The frequency of chiropractic is fit for function, meaning that we have the ability with the frequency that we see our patients to really make a difference in their nervous system. Average medical doctor sees a patient 2.7 times per year. 2.7 times per year. Maybe that's once every six months. Chiropractic patients are average, seen on average twice a week. Twice a week. So you have that intensity that's needed, or we'll call it the, the uh, concentration of treatment to really change neurological function. And neurological change requires a couple things. Specificity, you have to do the right thing, right? The specific adjustment, where does that come from, right? That's as old as the profession. Repetition. I mean, you got to do it over and over again in intensity. So if you ever have somebody that comes to you and says, you know, you are, um, you know, you're seeing your patients too much, right? You're over treating. The neurological model is the answer for those that say you over treat. Would you ever tell your kids you're doing your math problems too many times? Stop studying your vocabulary words. You're spending too much time on it. It's too, you're over, you're over training your brain. Right? You're overtraining your vocabulary. Don't read so much because you're reading too much. It's ridiculous, right? Because we know from a learning perspective that learning takes repetition and intensity. Well, so does muscle pattern retraining. We're not just cracking joints and releasing air. When we do an adjustment, we're actually changing muscle tone, changing the feedback to the brain allowing the brain to adapt, adapt to that new feedback and then changing the muscle tone from that point forward. I gave a great example yesterday, at least I thought it was great, a great example yesterday in the uh, medical errors panel about how chiropractic might work from a very high level. You break your arm, it gets put into a cast. You're walking around like this for two months. How much information is your brain getting from that arm? Hardly any, it's like no, no tissue contact from the outside, no joint proprioception from movement, and it's fixated there for a period of time. They've actually done studies that show the part of your brain responsible for feeling and controlling that joint, if it's immobilized for too long, actually starts to degrade. We lose brain matter in that area. Same thing happens with low back pain. When we have chronic low back pain, there have been studies that show the part of our brain and the somatosensory cortex, as well as the motor cortex for voluntary motor control, begins to degenerate after a period of time with low back pain. So back to the fixation. That arm in a cast, to me, is a metaphor for subluxation. It's a metaphor for joint fixation. If you could go to that patient who had a healed cast, let's just say that person's cast 
uh, was on and they couldn't get it taken off because their doctor was booked up for three years. And their arm was completely healed. And you can go in and just go, almost like, like Chuck Norris or something like that, rip the cast off, right? And now their arm is moving free again. What did you just do for that patient? You just gave all that feedback back to the brain. That's no different than someone who maybe had an injury that the brain compensated by creating a fixation of a joint to protect itself from further injury. Now it's healed, but in that period of time, it's immobilized, getting decreased feedback to the brain. You come in and adjust that joint. Now all of a sudden the brain is getting that information, not just through the adjustment, but now every single time that person turns their head or moves their arm. Right, so you can kind of see how chiropractic can actually change the brain function, but it needs to be done with specificity, repetition, and intensity. Is neurological assessment outside of chiropractic? Well, there's your electroencephaloneurometephalograph, right? Say that five times fast. B.J. Palmer, 1940, I think 39, 1939, invented the electroneurometephaloencephalograph, basically to measure nerve pulses coming from the brain and exiting the spine so that he could become more specific with his adjustment, but also measure the results or the outcome of the adjustment. So neurological assessment is as old as chiropractic. So is it outside of chiropractic? No, it's, it's, it's fundamental to chiropractic. But to understand how to do neurological assessment, we have to kind of get into not too deep because it sounds scary, and just some engineering models. So there's a model called black box engineering. Uh, and what this is, is a lot of times with computer software, this black box uh, engineering or black box hypothesis testing is used because you've got a million lines of code and the thing's not working. If you have a million lines of code in software and it's not working, we were actually just talking about this a couple minutes ago with the AV guy, um, not with code, but with problem solving with AV. Do you go through a million lines of code to figure out where things are not working? Or do you try something else to see if something else works and triage it? Right, they were saying before that they were having a problem, one of the projectors were out. So do you think that they started and you know, where the first thing they set up was the, you know, maybe a power strip, they checked the power strip. Okay, power strip is fine. Is everything plugged in the power strip? Everything's plugged in. Is everything plugged in from the power strip to the device? They don't do that. They're gonna say, you know what? Let's switch sources. Let's see if there's a problem with the source. And all of a sudden, boom, the projector comes on. Okay, so there's a problem with the source. What source was that? Okay, it's computer number one. Let's check to make sure computer number one is plugged into the video source. Oh, that's what it was. They didn't go through all one million things, but that's what we have to do in medicine as well too. So the black box represents something that you can't see. We can't see the brain, right? But we gotta try to measure it. We need to try to assess it. So how do we assess the brain? Well, we give it an input and we look at the output. And before we start talking about neurological testing, let's do this nice and simple. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this tomorrow in the, the ABCs of Receptor-Based Essentials course that the, the FCA has lined out for you tomorrow. So you'll, if you come tomorrow, you wanna learn more about neurology, you'll see this slide again. You'll be the smartest person in the room because we'll talk about it and you already know it. But if I put one into this black box and out comes two, there's a couple possibilities, right? And bear with me for a second here. I know this is kind of like, where are we going with this? I promise you it's going somewhere. It's either could be adding one or multiplying by two. So how do you know which one it is? Shout it out if you know it. Maybe put another number into the box. Does that work? Okay, so we put a two into the box and out comes a four. What are we thinking? Is it adding one? No, it's multiplying by two. Maybe. Would you be willing to put your entire life savings and all your future life earnings on that? Or do you think it might be some crazy calculus formula that we just don't know because we haven't tried it enough yet, right? So I would say no, I wouldn't risk my life savings and my life earnings on that. I'm gonna put a three in the box. I put a three in the box and out comes a six. I put a four in the box, out comes an eight. I put a five in the box, out comes a 10. These are all expected outcomes based upon what I thought. So I know the box multiplies by two. Now, all of a sudden, I put a 10 in the box and out comes 4,963. Does that mean the box is not multiplying by two? It's not doing what it's supposed to do? Or does it mean there's something wrong with the box where it just can't process 10 properly? It's that last scenario that's the true scenario. So with neurological testing, that's what we do. We control the input 
and we measure the output based upon what we expect to come out. Let's bring this back to your world. Patient walks in, they lie prone on your adjusting table, you look at their legs. One leg is shorter than the other. Okay, but say the right leg is short. Anybody do this kind of stuff in their practice? Okay, right leg is shorter than the left. Does that automatically tell you X is wrong? I would suggest there's probably a lot between the bottom of their shoe and their brain. Okay, maybe they wore out one of their shoes too much. Maybe they've got an ankle misalignment. Maybe their tibia is too short. Maybe their femur is too short. Maybe their pelvic is rotated. Maybe they've got something going on that's causing their leg. There's a million possible scenarios, right? So what might you do? Well, let's see, I'll, I'll bend their legs up, bend their knees. Now all of a sudden it switches over to the opposite side. You're like, whoa, wait a second. That's a different input with a different output. And you're starting to say, okay, well maybe it can't be the tibia anymore because if I would have brought the legs up, the tibia still would have been short. So maybe it is the femur. So you could do something that, how often does that happen? Not very often. Um, so you're thinking, well maybe they've got some sort of a misalignment. So your experience combined with your observation says, hey, you know what? I might adjust the pelvis or L5 or whatever it might is. You might do the activator dance, whatever it is you might do. But once again, giving more input, seeing what the output is so that you can then predict the right treatment. Neurology is no different. Same thing. The only thing that we're looking at here in neurology and combined with joint malposition is something called functional decompensation. Functional decompensation has a definition. It represents the functional deterioration of a structure or system that had previously been working. So it could be an area of the brain, it could be a part of the body, so this is not exclusive to brain, but we call these things now neurological decompensations. So someone that has frontal temporal dementia, there's nothing physically wrong in the early stages with frontal temporal dementia, but they have neurological decompensation in the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. You guys follow this? And the decompensation may occur due to stress, fatigue, age, disease, a number of things. But once a system is compensated, it can function despite stressors or defects. So if you can wear two hats as a chiropractor, one of them being biomechanist, the other being neurological, and wear those two hats at the same time, you would then say, my job as a chiropractor is to make sure that the nervous system is fully compensated and the body, the joint articulations are moving the way they're designed to be moved. And that gives you a whole body solution. No, we're not addressing chemistry, we're not addressing emotions, you know, thoughts, traumas, toxins, we're only doing two, one of the three, um, but still allows you to look a little bit deeper. So today we're gonna look at three domains of dysfunction. So many neuro neurological challenges present with similar functional deficits, but yet very different symptoms. From my experience, and I've seen now like 6,000 patients or so, all neurological conditions, I, right out of the gates from chiropractic school, I said, I want to do neurology. And silly me, and, and Matt's probably here, I think I saw him somewhere, I opened up in Charleston, South Carolina, one of the most uh, medically conservative areas you can possibly open a practice where you know, I said, a patient would come up to me and say, hey, I've got headaches. And I'd say, okay, cool, come on in. Let me go check with my doctor first. Okay. Um, hey, you know what? I've got uh, numbness and tingling in my hand. Come on in, I can help you out with that. Well, let me go check with my general practitioner first. So coming out the gate saying, I'm gonna be a neurology practice, straight out the gates in Charleston was not an easy thing. I was eating ramen noodles, DJing in the night just to pay my staff during the daytime. Um, but I was stubborn. Jennifer knows how stubborn I am. Um, when I get my mindset on something, I do it. I wanted to be a complex neurological case, but the reason why I'm going there is I've seen, I had this one patient that came all the way up from like Greensboro, South Carolina, and she came in a handy van, she was in a wheelchair, and I said, hey, how did you hear about me? She said, I heard you're the Dr. House of South Carolina. I don't know if that's a good thing, like my drug addict or do I limp or what, um, but you know, she kind of heard that we kind of think outside the box, and realistically, when you see these types of patients, we're not treating their label. We always say labels are for cans, not for people, right? What we're doing is we're looking at their functional deficits to see where things are working well and where they're not working, 
And if we can establish a plan that'll make things work better for them, that patient's gonna feel a lot better. So Parkinson's disease looks a lot like concussion. Concussion looks a lot like dementia. Dementia looks a lot like ADHD. When you start looking at all these patients from a full neurological uh, perspective, their conditions are very different, but fundamentally there's deficits that exist in all these patients that are pretty common. And the commonalities that I was able to think about for a two hour lecture are balance, ocular motor function, and cognitive. If I can get you guys to analyze these three things, even at a high level, I would suggest, this is me throwing a, a number out there, don't hold me to this, I like to speak with integrity, but I'll tell you, my integrity is this is a wag, a wild guess, um, and I left out the middle word. Um, but I would probably say, if you can assess those three things, you could probably assess 90% of your patient's nervous system and with some pretty high resolution to see if they need some neurological care. Whether you can deliver that or not, that's totally up to you, but at least you can identify it, which is a lot more than anybody else is doing, to be honest with you, for these patients. These measures that we're gonna talk about today give us good sensitivity, but poor specificity. And this is a term in research that we use. Sensitivity is the ability to detect a problem. Specificity is the ability to identify the problem. Right, so these tests will let you figure out if there's a problem, it won't tell you what the problem is though. You have to do more assessment for that. So here's a paper that was straight out of Stroke, um, which is probably one of the highest impact factor journals. And the conclusion was postural instability was found to be associated with early pathological changes in the brain and functional decline even in apparently healthy subjects. So balance is a great indicator of early neurological decompensation. I don't want to call it, you know, neurological pathology or anything like that. That sounds scary. Decompensation. It's a new word you can teach your patients. That's not a lesion where they run back to their neurologist and say, my chiropractor says I have a brain lesion and they order an MRI and they call you a bunch of names. Um, so just using the proper vernacular, using the proper vocabulary, we'll say that these patients, uh, even though they're apparently healthy, have neurological decompensation if their balance is poor. So let's talk about balance. There's three factors. You've got the vestibular organs, the eyes, and stretch receptors. Those three inputs to the brain allow us to have balance. And as we discussed yesterday, if you were here, you remember, for those of you that weren't, humans should not stand. We, we just, in all, like if you go to an engineer and say, hey, this person's standing on two feet, they're like, no, they're not. It's, that's impossible. Their foot is one sixth of their height. They're top heavy. And also, they, you know, they sway all over the place and they move. Their base of support is so small and they're so tall. Could you imagine a building like in New York City or in Dubai that is so tall with such a narrow base that's made out of soft tissue, made out of a soft structure. Imagine like the, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai made out of a soft polymer. You would say that building's gonna last how long? Maybe till somebody burps or farts or something like that, right? And I'll, it just falls over, right? That's what people are like. When our muscles are not contracted, what do we do? We drop like a sack of potatoes, right? So theoretically, we should not be upright, but our brain getting the input from our muscles, from our eyes, from our vestibular organs, integrating that and creating a motor output allows us to stand on one foot, to dance, to walk. Walking seems like such a trivial thing, but walking, all it is is a series of controlled falls. I'm falling, I caught myself. I'm falling, I caught myself. I'm falling, I caught myself. And I said we stand on two feet, but realistically, how many feet do we really stand on? One foot most of the time, right? Who stands like this all day? Right, we're often, more often than not, on one foot at a time. So it's a, it's a miracle that we can actually walk on two feet. And it's all because of how amazing our brain is. When our brain becomes less amazing, our ability to stand on one foot or two feet decreases. So we need to be able to measure that. So how we're gonna do that is the best test, the balance error scoring system test. It's largely utilized in a concussion setting for concussion screening. 
Athletic trainers do it, physical therapists do it. Uh, all your sports teams, the, the coaches are typically trained on how to do the best test to see if, a, if a, uh, uh, an athlete needs to get taken out of a game. But if we look at concussion, and I, concussion is like my thing. I love concussion. I hate it, but I love it. I hate it for people. I love it because it interests me. Um, when we look at concussion, concussion is the epitome of a neurological decompensation. There's nothing wrong physically with their brain. Like if you image their brain, nothing wrong. But these people sometimes are just devastated with function. They can't do anything. They can't go outside. They've got to wear blue blocker sunglasses. I didn't even know they make those anymore. Did you guys know that? Blue blocker, remember the commercials? Blue blockers are there, really dark, dark sunglasses that came all the way around the side. People have to wear those sunglasses because just light, like lighting in this room is too bright for them because their brain can't process that visual stimulus. I had a patient one time that any time she turned to the left, she would faint after a concussion. So she walks into my office and she goes to take a left turn and she goes like this. She can only turn to the right because anytime she received vestibular input from the left side, she would have such an autonomic consequence that she would, her, she would drop her blood pressure and she would pass out. And for those of you saying that's impossible, have you guys ever seen the videos of people on the slingshot over here in Orlando? It's always the guys too, the macho guys. My wife's like, do you want to go on it? I'm like, hell no. It's this thing where they, they put you and a, somebody else inside this seat and it's like this, it's like a slingshot. It's like elastic bands, they pull it all the way down. All of a sudden it goes, boom, and it shoots you away in the air. The guys are always passing out. I don't know why it's the guys, not the gals, but the guys are always passing out. You can find the videos on YouTube. I'm not making this stuff up. But if you're saying that a woman can't turn to left, otherwise she passes out, why would a guy on a slingshot pass out? He's not scared. It's a neurological consequence of vestibular input. It's overstimulating his brain, and his brain says, I can't do this, out. So whenever she would turn to the left, her brain says, I can't do this, out. But she imaged her brain, nothing there. So concussions are a really good example of what happens when your brain is just not functioning as it's designed to do, and they use this assessment for concussions. So if concussion is the epitome of diagnosis for neurological syndrome, you could use this for any neurological syndrome. As long as they've got two legs that work, you can do this test. So the equipment you need for this is a stopwatch, a foam pad, which I unfortunately don't have today. I was supposed to go to the office and pick it up, but I didn't get there in time, and a scoring sheet. Uh, 20 seconds in each condition, you count the errors and you tally them up. And we're gonna show you guys how to do this and we're gonna let you do it. So in a second, we're gonna find some partners. If you're comfortable doing so, if you don't want to, am I allowed to do this, Jen? People getting together and doing stuff? If you're comfortable with it. Okay, and if you're gonna get together, just have your face coverings on. Um, but let's apply it. Let's just not make this butt in a seat for two hours. Let's do some work and let's, let's get that muscle memory going on so you guys can do this. So we're gonna count the errors and tally them. We're not gonna do the foam pad because we don't have them. But here, here's how it goes. Best errors, count one error for each occurrence of these in 20 seconds. Anytime the person opens their eyes. So if they're standing like this and they start to wobble and they open their eyes, error. They close their eyes again, they get back in position. And all of a sudden they, maybe they, they go, or they take their hands off their hips, they go like this. That's an error. So you have the listing of errors. They're hands off the hips, more than 20 degrees of any angulation of the torso, lifting their foot. So if they're here and they lift up their foot, or if they're on one foot and they place their foot down, that's an error. If they step or they fall, or if they remain out of position for more than five seconds. So if they're here, they with their eyes closed and they're, they're going like this, one, two, three, four, five. How many errors did that person just get? Two, one for the hand coming off the hip, another one for being out of the position for five seconds. Okay? This is like easy stuff. Actually, you know, I've got, um, I got five kids two sets of identical twins. Got a 15 year old that just got a driver's permit. Um, I, I've got two 12 year olds and I've got two two year olds and the 12 year olds and the two year olds are twins. My 12 year olds know how to do the best test. So if a 12 year old can do it, like are you smarter than a fifth grader sort of thing, right? I know you guys all are. So we can definitely do this. So what I want you to do now, if you're comfortable, select a partner. Um, you don't necessarily have to select them right this second, but you can say, hey, you, you're my partner, or you, you're, we're gonna work together, if you wish to do this. 
we're going to do a couple of different things. We're going to be doing four tests. So it'll benefit you to select a partner and do this, and you're going to do all four tests on them. And basically, what you get out of it is you get a neurological assessment. What they get out of it is a neurological assessment, and you both get out of it the pragmatic application of this for your patients. So we're going to be able to do it, and you're going to see how people mess up and how to do it right. And we're going to walk through this every time. Every single one that we do, so we're doing four of these, we're going to take a couple of minutes. Question. Can I ask a question real quick? Yes. Um, is it going back to the percentages, 20 or 30 degrees? 20 or 30 degrees? F oh, for off balance or for out of, it's supposed to be 30 degrees. That's 30. what the, that's what the papers, uh, that's what the research says. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So 30 degrees, if they move more than 30 degrees off their body, uh, vertical axis, that becomes an error. Okay, so if you have a partner, uh, what we're going to do is we're actually going to do the modified balance error scoring system because we don't have foam pads. Here's the difference. The best test, the full best test, you do double leg stance, single leg stance, tandem stance on firm surfaces, and you do them all over again on a foam surface. So the modified is just the firm surface. The full test is on a foam surface. So you guys may be saying, okay, well, if I want to do this, where do I get a foam surface? Script Hesco, any of your suppliers, you just get an Airx pad, A-I-R-E-X. Airx pad, they're these blue squares, and they're the ones that are pretty well standardized for foam densities, uh, an Airx pad. Where it says ND on that, and you guys can take pictures of this, by the way. I think you also have it in your handout. There's a, there's a table in there as well. ND means your non-dominant foot. So single leg stance on your non-dominant foot, Single leg stance, your non-dominant foot is back, is your point of support, on the, always on your non-dominant foot, okay? So you'll go through the firm surfaces, 20 seconds each, so hands on the hips, feet toge together, excuse me. Double leg stance, close your eyes, count for 20 seconds, look to see if they take their hand off their hip, or if they lift up their foot on one side, or if they start angling their body, um, and then you count the errors, the next one you're gonna do is single leg on your non-dominant foot. So my right foot is my dominant, so I stand on my left foot, eyes closed, hand on the hip. Okay, you get a little more wobbly here. 20 seconds, okay, and then you're gonna count how many errors they have, you mark in the column. Tandem stance, left foot back, right foot forward, hands on hips, close your eyes. It gets a little harder because now your weight is kind of more centered where before on one foot you kind of had your weight a little more evenly distributed from left to right. 20 seconds there. You write how many errors and you subtotal the errors. So right there I had zero errors except for my demonstration. And then we would put the foam surface down to do the full best test and do the same exact thing on the foam surface. For the tandem stance on the foam surface, usually you have to do it diagonally because sometimes you can't fit your feet front to back so you put it on a diagonal. So if this is my foam pad right here and I'll, I'll do it for you guys in a second. This is my foam pad. You might wanna do it this way first here and then turn them obliquely on the foam pad in order to do it this way, okay? So if these are these squares, I don't know if you can see them or not, but I've got rectangles here, so do it like this. You can, okay, cool. Yeah, so I like got on the rectangle, feet together, one foot up, and then turn obliquely, diagonally on the foam surface to do it that way, okay? And you're gonna add up the, the subtotal the errors there, and then you get the total errors of both columns, and that is your best score. Um, I had a question that says, what if somebody has like an ankle injury, torn ligaments in their ankle, they pulled their hamstring? Well, remember, we don't operate in a vacuum. Okay, so people, like the great creator said, we're allowed to have more than one condition, right? Um, so if somebody has like ligamentous damage in their ankle and you don't want them to stand on their non-dominant leg, you can put them on their dominant leg, but just make sure you notate that, that the best test was done with dominant leg on the foam surface, dominant leg forward. Now if that's gonna, but you also keep in mind that that may throw off your numbers. However, if it's a chronic injury, meaning they've had it for a period of time, you can still use that assessment because what's gonna happen is, is even two months later, three months later, they still have ligamentous damage and if their balance gets better, that means you've upregulated the system that helps them with balance. Does that make sense? Cool. So always, you know, remember, we have to wear multiple hats. A surgeon in surgery, doesn't just get to cut. They're responsible if the patient dies, they're the responsible if the patient wakes up. You know, you have to wear multiple hats when we're doing this uh, and uh, make sure that we consider all things. I've got a couple more questions over here and I'll be right there. Um, 
So another question was barefoot or not. How, as long as you do it the same every single time, it doesn't matter. But typically no shoes. Okay, how do you know what's your dominant or non-dominant foot? There's a couple ways you can do this. You can ask somebody to say, hey, what do you kick a soccer ball with? And they'll say, well, I'm not from Brazil, so I don't kick soccer balls. You say, well, if you were to kick me, what foot would you kick me with? And that would be their dominant foot. Okay? Has nothing to do whether they're right or left handed. What is the first scoring way? What you know, is there a key for scoring them to see what's the you know, normal, not normal? Yep, we're gonna go through that next. Okay. Yep, I'll show you guys that. And it's actually it's right here if you wanted to go to that. I just couldn't fit it okay, on the sheet. As far as his position, mm -hmm. is it is it basically the other foot is touching mm -hmm. the back of the other foot? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Tandem which stance. Foot goes forward, the dominant, dominant foot. The dominant always goes forward. forward. Dom yeah. Dominant, dominant foot goes forward. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, and I purposely wanted to leave my mic on for the attendees so they can hear the questions and the answers. So hopefully they're getting all that. Yep. It's not an error. Yeah. If they're if they're wobbling a little bit, as long as it's under 30 degrees, and they. If they're out of so position for five seconds? If it, yeah, if they're out of position for under five minutes within five seconds. 30 degrees, they're okay. If, if it's under five seconds. Even if they're under five seconds for the whole time, if they're standing like this? Yeah. As long as it's under the 30 degrees, because it's, if they're making the error for they more than five seconds. They can do that. Yep. And, and it's fine. Five seconds, you don't count. If it's 20 seconds, if you don't count it. Because they're not out of, they're not in yeah. error for more than five seconds. Okay. So I'll, I'll readdress that. So Here's another good question, and this is semantical stuff, but this is why we do these breakouts, because these are questions you're going to have in practice. What if you're doing this, patient stays hands on their hips, I'm going to get up on stage. What if, what if the patient's here like this for 20 seconds? They're, not, they're out of position for more than five seconds, but realistically we need to change what that says. The test is erroring for more than five seconds. Okay, so what I, I did a demonstration where they took their hand off their hip for more than five seconds. That's erroring for more than five seconds. So out of position means like, okay, they put their foot down for more than five seconds, or they were over here greater than 30 degrees for more than five seconds. If they're at 29 degrees for 20 seconds, it doesn't count. Okay, so they have to be in error for five seconds or greater in order for you to count that as an error, okay? Dr. Antonucci, yes. we have a question. Sure. Um, you mentioned a foam pad that you use mm -hmm. um, without getting you know, really into names or anything like that that we can't do during Got class. It. Okay. Um, is there you know, any type of foam pad that you would specifically recommend? Um, I, or things to look for within the foam pad or anything like that? So let's do it this way. If you were to read the paper that's in your notes, they talk about a pad that they use and I don't think it's promotional. It's called an Airex pad, A-I-R-E-X. It's a brand of pad, but that's pretty standardly used across the, the profession. I have no disclosure. I don't want to work for Airex or anything like that. And where do, can they find those? Um, your supplier, like wherever you buy medical supplies, usually those can be found there. You can go on Amazon. They have them on Amazon. They're, they're pretty pervasive everywhere. It's an error every time. More, yes. It's an error each time they do it. So if you're here on one foot and they put their foot down, that's error one. Then they're staying there for six seconds, that's a second error. Yeah, but if they go like this, that's an error, that's an error, that's an error, that's an error. Correct, yeah. I'd like to. Dr. Antonucci, we have another question. Would a shower towel folded like in a quarter work? In dire straits, yes. But the reason why they use the foam surfaces is the foam density is specific for balance. Yeah, so you can't, you can use a shower towel, you can use in a crunch, you can use a, 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 I don't know, a cushion off your couch or sofa. 
in a crunch, what we're the, the, uh, the concept is, is you've got to give them a surface that's not solid, a perturbed surface. But the, the balance foams have specific density foam that's designed for balance testing. So in a clinical situation, you don't want to be like, hey, let me go grab a, some towels out of the bathroom and test your balance. But if you're like, let's just say your kid's at a soccer game and they get hit in the head with the ball and all you have is an extra blank in the trunk of your car, absolutely that would work because it's, it's going to be softer than a firm surface. But try to be as compliant as possible to how the research supports it using a balanced foam pad. There's another question. Do you have to be in error for how long? Suggestion of five seconds? So every time you make an error, it counts as an error. If you're in error for five seconds or more, it counts as an additional error. Okay, so hopefully that clarifies it. So like I said, if you're standing one foot and you put your foot down, that's error number one. And if it takes you more than five seconds to get back up in a position, <laughs> you count that as two errors. Can you demonstrate can you demonstrate the errors quick versus the five second rule and which count as errors? Yeah, sure. So let me um, grab my clicker again. I'm gonna move back to the slide. We'll go through the errors one more time. So here's the errors on your screen. So the first one would be if you're standing with your feet together, I'm not gonna go through all the positions. What I'll just do, let's just say I'll just put on, on one foot count. just because that makes it a little easier. Yeah. So they're gonna close their eyes. If they open up their eyes, that's an error. They close it again, they open again, that's another error. They close their eyes again, they open again, we're all within 20 seconds. Those are all errors, okay? Then the other one is hands off hip, so they could be like this and they can take their hand off their hip just to gain their balance. Those, each one of those is an error. Now where it gets tricky is where they put out their hand and open their eyes, that's two errors. Okay, so it's just a matter of being observant and counting the errors. The other one is more than 30 degrees of angulation. So if you have me being up straight is here, 90 degrees here, 45 degrees here. So anything past here, about 30 degrees, is going to be another error. Okay, so you kind of have to eyeball that. Um, when you're on one foot, putting your foot down is an error. And then remaining out of position for five seconds is in the, in the position for five seconds. Now here's where it gets tricky. Let's see if we can count these real quick. Ready? Okay. Counting 20 seconds, all of a sudden I go like this. How many errors was that? Three. Exactly. I opened my eyes, I took my hand off my hip, and I put my foot down. Three errors right off the bat. Okay, so this is where you kind of have to get proficient at this and just, it's observing. It's observing the person. And here's a trick for observation. Never look at the patient. Okay? And this is what I mean by this. I want everybody to look at my hand and tell me how many fingers I'm holding up. Fingers am I holding up? Okay, so if you're looking at my hand, you don't see that I'm holding two more fingers up over here. Okay, so when you foveolize on something, you have two degrees of visual acuity. So your visual acuity is the width of your thumb at an arm length away. That's where you see clearest. That's your foveal vision. Everything around that is called your parafoveal vision. And where you're clearest seeing there in your foveal vision, you best see motion in your parafoveal vision. So that if somebody's gonna hit you with a baseball bat, you don't see it's a Louisville slugger or an Easton, you just see a baseball bat coming at you. So when you look at your patients, try not to look at body parts. Don't look at their eyes to see if their eyes are open. Don't look at their hands on their hips to see if their hand's coming off. Just observe the patient because when they do this with their eyes open, you need to be able to see everything that just happened. Here are uh, some of the normative values, which you can get by going to the reference that's on your handout. There's a paper that's a bit.ly link because the link was like that long. So if you type in that bit.ly link in your web browser, you'll be able to get the full paper that has all of these. They've got them broken off by sex. They got them broken off by ages. They even get it broken out by body mass index. So people that are obese tend to have poorer balance than people that are not obese. Does that mean poor people with obesity have poorer brains? You can draw your own conclusion, right? But the, basically the test says yes. So you can have superior, above average, broadly normal, below average, poor, and very poor uh, for the number of total errors. Remember, this is firm plus foam errors. The modified balance error scoring system, which we did yesterday, has its own set of error validation. 
Okay, we're not going to take five minutes. We're going to keep going because we took five minutes longer than we needed to. So we're going to document ocular motor function. The eyes are the window to the brain. Okay, we used to say the eyes are the window to the soul, but we know the soul exists inside the brain. Um, basically, you can get a lot of information just looking at someone's eyes about how their brain is functioning. Here's a paper from a, a journal called Cerebellum. Once again, very high impact factor journal, 2018. The title of Eye Movement Research in the 21st Century, A Window to the Brain, Mind, and More. Um, and basically the conclusion was that by looking at eye movements, you can make, deduce a whole lot about people's brains simply because there's six muscles that move the eyes and the entire brain controls those six muscles. Here are the pathways associated with making a saccade. So a saccade may be a term you haven't heard before. Saccade comes from the French word for jerk. This is a jerk eye movement. So basically, when you're fixating on one point and you moved your eyes to fixate on a new point, that's a saccade. It's a fast eye movement from one point to another. Um, it's an easy, yet very complex motor function that involves nearly every region of your brain. Parietal lobe, frontal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, cerebellum, brainstem. The entire brain is involved in these fast eye movements. So there's so many metrics that you can get out of saccades and they provide a whole lot of diagnostic information. But we don't have time to get into that today. Actually, I wouldn't have time to get into that in a full day with you. You know, that's like a 25 hour course just on saccades alone that, that we end up teaching uh, because there's so much to learn here and there's so much exciting information. Like for example, if you gave me, I've got a piece of equipment in my clinic called a saccadometer. It measures saccades. If you put up saccades of different patients, I could pretty much tell you what condition they have based upon how fast their eyes accelerate how fast they decelerate, the accuracy of them, and how long it took for them to make the eye movement. I can tell you that person's got you know, early cognitive decline, that person has concussion, that person has Parkinson's. That's the one that's the hardest one for me to tell the difference between. A concussed patient looks so much like a Parkinson's patient, without a patient sitting in front of you, it's hard to tell the difference between the two of them, which is kind of scary. I've had 13-year-old patients that look like they have Parkinson's disease from the neurological testing. And what do we also know about chronic concussions? What does it look like in later in life? Like Parkinson's. CTE, the early stages of CTE looks just like Parkinson's, except more emotionality associated with it. Scary, scary stuff. So what we're gonna look at now are things called dysmetric saccades. Dysmetria means, literally means abnormal movement. If you went to medical terminology, dys means abnormal, metria means measurement. So abnormal measurement. If the dysmetric saccade can be either hypometric, hypo meaning short, or hypermetric meaning long. So it's either an overshoot or an undershoot. Um, and by the way, I have them flipped on there by accident, sorry about that. Hypometric means undershot of the target. Hypermetric means overshot of the target. Both of these dysmetric eye movements decrease the ability of the brain to collect the information it was intending to collect. So if I were looking over here and I wanted to see who was coming in the door and all of a sudden my eyes went there, then like, oh crap, I didn't make it. I had to make another saccade. It decreased the efficiency of me gathering that information. What does that lead to? Poor reading comprehension. Sometimes these people are labeled with dyslexia. Slow reading, once again, a lot of times dyslexia. Blurred vision, sometimes you're like, I need new glasses. You go to the optometrist and they say, your, your prescription's fine. Nothing wrong with your prescription. Neck tightness, whoa, wait a second, that's a stretch, right? Humor me for a second. Take your index fingers, put them in your neck muscles, like your suboccipitals. Look straight ahead, keep your head as still as you possibly can and move your eyes side to side. Tell me what you feel. Can you feel your neck muscles contracting? Your neck muscles contract whenever you move your eyes. Embryologically, our eye movements are linked to neck muscle movements. This happens five weeks after conception, that part of the brain forms, that our eyes are connected to our neck. Let's face it, nobody turns their head like this, right? We look and turn, we look and turn to increase the efficiency of our eye movements. So if people's eyes are not hitting targets properly, they're recruiting neck muscles then to get their head there and they get chronic neck pain. As a matter of fact, I get patients all the time referred to me from other chiropractors saying this patient's been under care for two years. I've given them 134 adjustments. Neck is still tight. Doc, what can we do? You know what my answer is? I'm not gonna adjust them because chances are your adjustment is just as good if not better than mine. Let me see what else is under the hood. And I get nine times out of 10, I even say 95 out of 100, 
We look at their brain, we fix their eye movements, and the neck pain goes away, neck tightness goes away. Clumsiness, disorientation, locomotion issues, poor balance. I gotta pick up speed a little bit because I wanna get this, through this stuff with you guys and I'm running short on time, I talk too much. <laughs> um, so this is what a normal eye movement might look like if you watch the video, oh, actually, that's a bit more long. A hypometric eye movement. Oh man, these videos get mixed up? I thought they might have been. Yeah, that's a hypermetric eye. When you see the eyes go past the target and then they come back to it. So that's what a patient will look like. Let me see if I can play that again. I don't know if I can. Yeah, watch the one on the, on the one all the way to the right that looks kind of like me, right? Eyes go past the target, then they come back. They go past the target, come back, neutral. Past the target, back, neutral. You see how they shoot past the target? That's a hypermetric saccade. So these can cause all sorts of problems with patients. But how do we identify this? Well, we're gonna document it through a test called the King Devic test. Once again, test that's really pervasively used for concussion, but it started off as a test that's used for dyslexia because it allows us to look at the efficiency of somebody's eye movements largely using saccades. So how we're gonna do this is we're gonna read numbers from left to right, top to bottom, as quickly as possible without making errors. And I'll show you the test cards in a second. You must complete all test cards without errors, otherwise you have to restart the test. Do not include the demonstration card, not care, uh, and timing, but time how long it takes to read all three cards. You can take a break in between cards, but you cannot look at the next card. So let me explain this a little bit more clearly. Test card number one, you get a stopwatch, you time how long it takes from to read all the numbers. You hit stop, okay? You write down the time, 18 seconds, whatever it was. Patient's like, oh, okay, I'm ready for the next one. You flip to the next card, Say ready, set, go. You start your timer, they start reading the numbers, they stop, you hit stop. It was 18 seconds again, okay? Test card number three, ready, go. You start your timer, they read the test card, you hit stop, 18 seconds again. To get your King, King Devic time, you do 18 plus 18 plus 18, that's your King Devic time. So your timing only reading time, not how long it takes to complete the test in whole. Does that make sense? You're only measuring the time that they're reading the card. Okay. Here's what the test cards look like. You've got a demonstration card, and let's talk a little about why this is this way. The demonstration card basically tells the patient how they're gonna read it. They're basically doing carriage returns. For those of you who don't know what a carriage return is, you remember the old typewriter, you hit the button, it goes ding, it goes to the next line. Okay, so basically you're, we're reading like a typewriter would write or like a normal person reads, from left to right, top to bottom but the demonstration card gives you that guidance. So you'd have the patient read through the demonstration card. They would say two, five, eight, three, nine, four, six, eight, three, six, seven, four, six, seven, zero, one, five, three, five, eight, three, seven, five, three, zero. But they would do it as quickly as they possibly can because this is a race, a race without errors. Okay, so you're like, okay, great, you did it. Now the cards are gonna get progressively more challenging for you as we go along. And then you're gonna give them test card number one. They're gonna go through and you're gonna have your timer. Okay, ready, go. And they're gonna do two, five, eight, zero, seven, three, seven, nine, four, six, five, three, one, six, four, seven, nine, seven, three, five, one, five, four, nine, two, six, five, five, seven, three, three, one, eight, six, four, five, three, seven, five, two. Okay, that would be my time. And you saw me kind of stutter at the end there, right? Because I was about to make an error I caught myself, I slowed down, and I answered correctly, so that made my time longer, meaning it increases my King Devic score, but I still got the card completed. Okay, so that's how this test works. Then we move on to card number two, which you see now when we move the guidelines, right? So you're really relying upon them having accurate eye movements. And then card number three, we remove the guidelines and we change the spacing. So their eyes have to be really accurately at hitting those numbers. You can see just how basic this test is, but how well it could possibly work for what it's intended to look at, right? Okay, so we're not gonna do this one. Is that okay, guys? If we don't test this one together, you guys can do it on your own just because I wanna give you all the goodies that I have to offer you. So here's the demonstration card. There's test one, there's test two, there's test three. Uh, unfortunately, I can't let you snap pictures of those because King Devic test is a copyrighted thing. You have to buy the test. 
Um, could you find it online? Uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, it's up to you to see if you wanna look for it, but you know, the support the company that did it, it's a test, okay? How did you do? So now the question is we need to know what normal is with all three of these tests. So here are 15 different studies that looked at normative values from healthy individuals to figure out how long it took them to do the test. What we're gonna look at is the last one. The very, very bottom says 43.82. So pretty much for all ages as a baseline guideline without getting into the nitty gritty of how old, uh, how fast are 20 year olds compared to 30 year olds, 30 year olds compared to 40 year olds, so on and so forth. We're just gonna say as a general screening that you have to be under 45 seconds. It says 43.82, you can raise the, or lower the bar a little bit to 45 seconds. If somebody takes longer than 45 seconds to complete this, what are your thoughts? What do you think? Is somebody shout it out? You're not thinking? <laughs> There's something wrong with what? Saccades, yeah, I heard somebody say it. There's something wrong with their saccades. They're not able to generate these eye movement properly. And if there's something wrong with their saccades, there's probably something wrong with what else? Their brain, okay? They have some decompensations that are not allowing them to live to their fullest potential. We're kind of climbing to the top of the pyramid of human function. We're gonna learn a little bit about cognitive testing. Uh, and now the cognitive testing that I wanna provide you, if you notice so far, all the tests that I'm giving you so far take less than a minute to perform. How long for the King Devic? Should be 45 seconds. How long was the best test? If you do the modified test, it's one minute. If you do the full test, it's two minutes because they're only 20 seconds each. I'm trying to give you guys things that you could take in your practice that are not gonna slow you down, right? Because if I gave you, like in a second, we'll talk about neuropsych testing. How many people here are willing to do eight hours of neurocognitive testing on their patients? Not in that business, right? That's not what we do. So we've got to give you things that you can do easily. So that's my objective for you. So comprehensive neurocognitive assessment takes approximately eight hours of testing. You have to assess all five domains of cognition um, because all of these domains overlap somewhat. So if I asked you to repeat these numbers after me, three, one, two, there's not just memory involved with that. There's sequencing, or you had to remember it, then you had to sequence it. There's timing, you have to say three, one, two, you don't say three, one, two. So you can see how just a simple task of repeat these numbers after me bridges multiple domains, and we'll talk about those domains in just a second. Dr. Antonucci. Yes. Uh, we have a question. How does reading numbers work for people who are also dyslexic? Well, th that's a great question. How does reading numbers work for people that are also dyslexic? Well, if their dyslexia is a, is as a consequence of their eye movements, they're going to still do poorly on this test. So one of the ways that I would want to do that is I'd want to give them individual numbers. Okay, because sometimes, not all the time, it's actually a lot less than you think. Typically, you when you think of dyslexia, you think of people that, uh, you know, make a P a D or a B a Q or something like that, they flip letters. That's a small percentage of individuals who are dyslexia, dyslexics. Um, so what you wanna do is if they have a really hard time on this and they say, I've been diagnosed with dyslexia, get some index cards and say, what number is this? What number is this? What number is this? What number is this? And if they get 10 out of 10 numbers, you know they're not transpositioning numbers their dyslexia is most likely as a consequence of ocular motor uh, issues, or it could be other things. They could be you know, not being able to retain information in, in more of a, a, a more of a cognitive realm, but that is actually another great example why you can't just rely on one test. You can't just do the best test and say, oh yeah, this person has no issues. You can't just do King Devic and say, this person has no issues. You kind of have to have a multiple sample, no different than our black box. You have to put more numbers into the box to be confident of what the box is actually doing. So there are some quick, non-specific cognitive tests that evaluate almost all five domains and determine if more testing is necessary. So here are the five domains. We've got planning and strategy. We've got concentration. We've got speed. We've got memory and we've got calculation and problem solving. Those are the five domains of cognitive function. 
Together, they comprise about 90% of all human thought and actions. Um, so if we can assess these things, that's a pretty good thing. And they're usually universally applicable, meaning that males and females don't differ. You don't differ by race. You don't differ by age. You don't differ by health status. Uh, they're pretty well uh, all fixed. And there's a time uh, that there was a time that people thought that intelligence was um, was basically uh, fixed. Like you were, what the intelligence you were born with is the intelligence you ever had. But that is becoming more and more questioned. And because people were saying that influ intelligence was not fluid, influ intelligence doesn't change. Has anybody here ever met somebody that was super smart and had something to them happen and all of a sudden they're not as sharp as they used to be? Whether it's chemotherapy, whether it's a brain injury, whether they developed an autoimmune condition, they just can't do things like they used to. Well, I'll tell you right now, I guarantee you their intelligence changed. I just had a patient two weeks ago, crazy story, 18-year-old, uh, um, he was basically, uh, it was a couple weeks, so he was actually right at the end of the year, his end of the senior year, um, he was actually driving to his buddy's house to get ready for prom. He didn't want to wear his dress shoes, so he had flip-flops on. He's driving his car, flip-flop, got the gas pedal went between his toes and the flip-flop, and he couldn't control the gas pedal, and he looked down to pull his foot out, boom, into a tree. Got ejected from the vehicle, uh, landed 100, they said about 100 feet after rolling from the vehicle, because he's going about 50, 60 miles an hour, uh, was in a coma, and uh, he was out of the coma, he came to see us for brain rehab. He was valedictorian of his class, he was uh, basically got a scholarship to go to Yale, um, and the guy, he was so smart. Kid can't add one plus one now. Did his intelligence change as a consequence of a brain injury? So intelligence cannot be fixed. And if intelligence can be decreased, it should be able to be increased. And just thinking abstractly, just think theoretically, if I taught that young man how to do one plus one again, what just happened to his intelligence? Went up, right? So it, it's, it is more fluid than we think. So don't think of this intelligence being fixed that you can't do anything about it. Um, because what we actually are finding in, in our practice, we assess cognitive function and the doctors are blinded to it. So they have no idea how well their patients are performing cognitively. We're just looking at physical medicine before and after treatment, and we're about to publish a paper that shows that people's cognitive scores are up like crazy doing chiropractic types of work, including neurology. So our goal is to do a, a study in the future to correlate that with IQ to see if chiropractic care implementing a functional neurology model can increase IQ. And we're really, really optimistic, not Trump optimistic, but we're really optimistic that we're going to see some changes there, okay? And that would be cool. Imagine having a paper you can hand to your patients that says, hey, look at plasticity centers did this paper, chiropractic and increase your IQ. Pretty neat, right? But you don't know until you assess it. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna do something called the Luria three-step test. This involves memory, planning, concentration, speed, and calculation, all five domains of cognition. And here's a paper that uh, shows that this is an evidence-based test. Laurier's three-step test, what is it, what does it tell us? Uh, this was uh, from a paper in the Journal of International Psychogeriatrics, um, and um, I thought there was a PubMed number on there. There's not, uh, if you wanna take a picture of this, if you wanna download the paper, you, you're welcome to do so. You'll just have to look up the DOI number on the right side there. Oh, nope, it's not, yeah, if it's on PubMed, but I just don't have a PubMed number for you. Um, but in, in the end, what it said is, the three-step Luria test distinguished between normal controls in persons with mild cognitive impairment from frontal, frontal temporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease, but did not distinguish dementia from Alzheimer's. Once again, a sensitive test that'll tell you something's wrong, but not specifically what's wrong. And when you see how easy this test is, you're like, wow, this is, this is gold, because you can do this in way less than one minute. So here's how the three-step goes. While sitting, the examiner will demonstrate the test. They place their right hand, knuckles first, down on their knee. I'll do it this way so they can see, and then I'll do it again in a second. Knuckles first on your knee. Oh, this is gonna be cool. I'm doing a best test with the Luria test at the same time. 
fist down, knuckles down. And these are, by the way, these pictures you're seeing are bird's eye view, like as if you're looking down on them. Okay, so otherwise you would say the hands up like this. The hands flat on the knee, on the right knee or table, then a chopping motion, then a patting motion. So it's fist, chop, pat. Fist, chop, pat. Okay? Then the examiner asked the patients to complete three cycles of this unguided. Okay? So fist, edge, palm, fist, edge, palm. The patient can count one, two, three. They can say fist, edge, palm. They can do whatever they want to do, but they have to get that order three times in a row in order to pass the Loria three step test. It's scored zero or one. Zero is unable to perform three cycles. One is able to complete three cycles. It's binary. They either did it or they didn't. They're normal or abnormal. And this test has been able to detect mild cognitive impairment in a medically, um, a, a peer reviewed journal, which is kind of cool. An alternative way you can do this, because you might get some kids that are like, this is a joke, doc. Okay, okay, if it's a joke, let me see how fast you can do five cycles. Okay, and now all of a sudden you get competition, you're timing them and they're like, and they're messing it all up. He's up, oh, wait, stop the clock. You messed up, it's not as easy as it looks, is it? Then they have to do five cycles timed and what would be really cool is you document that time on intake, you give them a month or two months of chiropractic care and then you have them do the same test over again two months afterwards after you work with their spine, you work with their nervous system. Now all of a sudden they're five seconds faster. That's kind of cool, right? Now your patients leave your office and say, hey, my doctor's not a backcracker. My doctor is kind of fixing my back, my brain, everything, my whole body. Right? That, that, that name is like, ugh, nails on a chalkboard. Is that like that for anybody else? Backcracker? Ugh, sorry. It's just literally like nails on a chalkboard for me. I used to have people like my friends when I got out of chiropractic school, hey doc, can you crack my back? You know, I would have adjusted you, but no, now I'm not. But <laughs> anyways, you don't even need to have test your partner. Let's get everybody to do this. So I'll put it back up there. Um, and I want to see if you guys can do three cycles. And then I don't want you to raise your hand if you can't do it. But what I also want you to do is maybe just communicate with your partner and just say, hey, were you able to do it? And if they say no, compare that against their best test. I would almost guarantee you that if you can't do this, you weren't very good at best test. Okay, because remember, the best test is a really good generalized brain function test. This is more specific to cognitive function, but if you're not good at this, you can't be good at the general stuff. Okay, so literally I'll give you one or two minutes just to try this on your own, um, and then just talk to your, your, your um, excuse me, your partner and ask them how they did with this. And then I'll take a minute or so to answer any questions about it. This is a pretty straightforward test, but go for it. Three cycles. You don't have to do it with the best test. That's just me trying to demonstrate for you guys. You can do it sitting, seated on your right knee, right leg. You can do right, left. With neurology, um, everything is right first. And it's kind of like, so we don't chop off the wrong leg, you know? So we always, if we forgot to take notes on what was, you know, what was not working right, if we did it first, it was on the right side. What's the difference if one hand is good and the other hand's not so good, right versus left? There's a couple of things that are possible there. Number one, uh, dominance can have a play with this. If you're right hand dominant, most often you're going to be better in the right hand. That's why Loria's test is often done on the right. 90% um, of the population, give or take, is right handed. Like 10%, I think maybe it might be up to 15% is left handed. Um, so dominancy does play into this. Um, however, what also can play into this, which might be interesting, if I'm right hand dominant and my left hand is better, you may think the left side of my brain is decompensated because the left side of my brain controls which hand? My right hand. So if somebody's right hand dominant and they can't really do it with their right hand, but they could do it with their left hand, you're gonna say, whoa, hold on. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That was something in the box coming out unexpected. I gotta figure out what that is and chances are, if that's the case, if they don't have any injuries and all things excluded, if you're living in a vacuum, they probably have something on the left side of their brain that's decompensated. That's a great question, thank you. Any other questions? Matt? 
Does memory play a factor? Yes, memory does play a factor. Remember, if I go back a slide or two or three, the Loria three-step test involves memory, planning, concentration, speed, and calculation. It's re involving all five of these domains. So if, if you're trying to do this with someone and they can't do it, it's always a good thing to say, hey, what happened there? I couldn't remember the sequence, right? And then you're going to say, okay, you know, note to self, I've got to check memory on this patient. If somebody says, I can remember it, but my, my hand just wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. Well, then you're starting to look at speed, coordination, planning, motor planning, things like that. So yes, memory does have a play in this, but it's not like if your memory is bad, I'm not going to test Loria's test. If your memory is bad, you're probably going to see it not be very good because this is a sensitive test, not a specific test. Okay, anybody else? Question, go ahead. Knuckles down. The, the question was, what was the position? So if we look at this again, this is a bird's eye view as if you're looking down at your hand. So it's knuckles down, chop, palm. Knuckles, chop, palm. Knuckles, chop, palm. Okay, so what you're looking at there is you looking down at your hand. That's what the author tried to illustrate there. Dr. Antonucci, we have another question. Yes. With proper patient compliance, what kind of, what kind of percentage of improvement would you look for with a high school patient with a head trauma and over what period of treatment time? Oh, that's a fantastic question. A little bit off the topic from this, but that's, we can talk about that for a second. Um, and the reason why I can speak to this is I'm actually in the process of having one of my papers peer reviewed right now. Uh, so I can't talk about the exact outcomes, but what we have um, in, in Orlando here is we have a five day program that we put people into um, with intensives. So it's a, basically they're seen three times a day um, and our 80% of our patients are concussion patients that are usually referred by other doctors or chiropractors. Uh, in five days, what we're able to see, and I'll, just, I'll spill the beans, it's fine. Uh, we're able to see about a 55% improvement in symptoms in five days and about a 35% improvement in cognitive scores. Um, as far as balance goes, we're usually seeing about a 70% improvement in balance in the five days. Uh, so you can take five days out of it we were doing basically 12 treatment sessions, 12 one hour sessions in five days. So I think that if you were to do that over multiple weeks, I don't think it would equate directly to 12 visits because I think you lose a little bit in between visits. It might take you more like 20 visits, but you can obtain these results as well too uh, with patient compliance, with the proper exercises. And the reason why I'm saying you lose a little bit in between visits, it, it's, it's a learning phenomenon. If you go to school, hey, you're not going to, you're in school right now. And when you leave this classroom, you're gonna remember Loria step is fist edge palm, maybe. If you don't do this for a week, you're not gonna remember, was it fist edge palm? Was it knuckles up, knuckles down? Was it right hand, left hand? Because there's an attrition to learning. Repetition, intensity, specificity, those are the things that are needed. So in order for you to be able to do this, for you to be able to get the improvements that we're seeing, you have to apply this information immediately so you can start looking at it. Now, the variable here that we just don't know is, to, to, to put it candidly, your skill set, right? Um, and let's not even make that offensive. I would not be very good in Mauricio's job as a plastic surgeon. My skill set's not there. But if I wanted to be a plastic surgeon, could I? Am I capable of that? Yeah, I would just have to do what? I'd have to go to school, I'd have to practice, and then I'd have a skill set, maybe being the best plastic surgeon in the country or the world. Potential, right? We have the potential to do this, just your skill set. So in training, you know, whether it's training through the FCA, training through other organizations that put on classes, you can get those concussions with, uh, those outcomes with high school concussion patients. High school concussion patients seem to fare the best out of all of them. Males better than females. This is research speaking, it's not sexist, it's not you know, anything like that. Uh, a lot of times it's actually because of their thinking because women's neck muscles are not um, as robust as men's neck muscles are because they don't have as much testosterone, so on and so forth. It's just an anatomical sort of thing so that when they have a concussion, they actually have more injury. They have more acceleration, deceleration. So typically women have worse concussions than men. 
so men seem to fare better than women as far as their outcomes go. But uh, from what we saw um, in our most recent research, once again, not spilling the beans too much, we didn't see any difference between men and women. We didn't see any difference between old and young, statistically. It's cool. Chiropractic with functional neurology, I think, is a major solution for concussion. Last test. So if somebody doesn't do well on the Loria test, what you want to do is you want to administer a more in-depth cognitive assessment. This is the outlier. This does not take one minute. This takes anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes to administer, but it's easy to do. It's a piece of paper, and it assesses a lot of different things. You're looking at orientation, short-term memory, executive function, language abilities, abstraction, attention, animal naming, clock drawing. So the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or the MOCA for short, is a great way for you to be able to do this. So here's, uh, once again, I tried to show you the evidence base for all these things that we're doing. Uh, this was published in American, Journal of the American Geriatric Society, 2019. It says, using a cutoff score of 26, the mini mental status examination had a sensitivity of 18% for mild cognitive impairment. That means it misses 82 out of 100, right? Because you guys were all taught the mini mental status exam, right? Mini mental state exam. Uh, alert and oriented times three, that sort of stuff. That was like OSCE's things. Has a, it's throw it out the window. It's useless. It misses 82 out of 100 mild cognitive impairments. Whereas the MOCA detected 90% of them. So it takes a little bit longer, but you get a 90% uh, sensitivity. In the mild autism, I'm mean, sorry, uh, Alzheimer's dementia, uh, Alzheimer's disease group, the mini mental status exam had a sensitivity of 78%. So if you are uh, looking at a patient and you want to figure out if they have Alzheimer's, mini mental status exam will only miss 22 out of 100. But the MOCA detected 100%. So this is just a much, much better test, and it's become the kind of the standard. Um, so the mild cognitive impairment as an entity is pretty much uh, uh, evolving controversially, but the MOCA is a brief cognitive tool with high sensitivity and specificity for detecting mild cognitive impairment, and most of all, measuring it. And here's the thing that my buddy, who um, he is the dean of uh, in, dean of internal medicine at University College of uh, uh, University of Central Florida's College of Medicine, um, he said that in the neurology department they're talking about using MOCA as a way to measure decline. Very nihilistic. Nothing you can do about it. We're just going to measure how quickly you decline. When I said, Doc, it's like I've got people coming in with. 21s going up to 28s after five days. He's like, what? So guess what I'm doing now? I'm compiling all my MOCAs, and we're going to publish a paper on it, Chiropractic and Functional Neurology, Improving Myocognitive Impairment. Okay, so those are the things that are coming out of my work right now and my team's work. So we're excited about that, and we're excited to be able to do that for you guys. Um, can you, uh, A.V., can you please switch over to that PDF just so we can show people looks like? Thank you so much. So this is what the MOCA looks like. Um, you can Google MOCA, um, that's what I did to, to get this, uh, it's a PDF that you can download. Uh, this is version 8.3, I think they got an 8.4 out now, so I'll just talk really quickly about how to do this, but I would encourage you, especially because I've got 5 minutes and 50 seconds left, uh, I would encourage you to read up on how to do this because there's an administration guide for it. It's short, it's like two pages long, you could probably read it you know, in, in 15 minutes, maybe want to reread it a second time. Um, but I'll kind of go through real quickly how to do it. The first test is called TRAILS test. It's a, an abbreviated version of TRAILS test. And if you're going to join us tomorrow uh, for the ABCs of receptor-based rehab and the C portion with cognitive assessment, we're going to be doing a lot more cognitive stuff like this, and you're going to actually get to do it. Uh, Dr. Garcia will be teaching that, um, and you're going to get TRAILS A and TRAILS B. So the way trail-making test works is you take a pencil or a pen, a utensil, you put the utensil in number one, and then you tell the patient to go. Okay? And what they have to do without lifting their utensil, they have to connect the numbers 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, 5E. Okay, so they're shifting between numbers and letters, sequencing with spatial cognition and timing. Once again, assessing all of those domains. The next one you see there is they have to draw the picture or copy the picture of the bed. OK, 
Okay, so they have to draw that. So that's a three-dimensional shape on two dimensions that requires spatial awareness and spatial knowledge and how to be able to have motor function to draw that bed. Now the grading scale will tell you what you can get points for, what you can't get points for. We get points for completion. So if they completed 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, they get one point. If they draw the bed, they get one point. Then you're gonna ask them to draw a clock that says five past 10, not 10.05, five past 10, which once again is a sequencing task and an abstraction test. Because if I say five past 10, you have to do what in your mind? Convert that to 10.05. Well, when you draw it, you have to be able to draw a circle. You have to be able to number the clock from 12 to 12, evenly spaced apart. You need to know that the minute hand is longer than the hour hand and you need to be able to know how to, so you can see there's a lot of cognitive function associated with drawing the clock. So you get a point for being the contour of the clock if it's a circle, you get a point for numbering it correctly, and you get a point for writing, drawing the hands correctly. So you can get three points on the clock drawing test. Then you ask them to name the animals that they see. They have to say horse, tiger, duck, okay? And if they say goose, that's fine, or you know, basically they need to get the animal. If they say, dog, pony, and dinosaur, that doesn't work. Uh, and sometimes they'll just say, I just don't know. You know I, I know what it is, but I can't get the word out of my mouth. Uh, and they don't get a point for that, so they get a point for each one. Now I gotta get a little closer to my screen to see this one. So the next one is memory, and it gives you directions. Read list of words, subject must repeat them. Do two trials, even when the first trial is successful, do a recall after five minutes. So Matt, this comes back to memory testing. So if they didn't do well, on the Luria and you think that it's a memory issue, this is when you're gonna go over to the MOCA and you can do this test on them. So you're gonna say leg, cotton, school, tomato, white. One word per second. No inflection of your voice because you don't wanna bias them in any way and they've gotta repeat them back to you. So they're gonna say leg, cotton, school, tomato, white. Now they might say leg, white, tomato, stool, cotton. They still get all of them right but they just have to do it, uh, all of them, I have to do all of them. So I got two minutes left, so let me crank through these. Attention, you're gonna ask them to repeat the numbers backwards. Language, you're gonna ask a, a question and get them to explain the, explain the meaning of it. Abstraction, what's the similarity between uh, a hammer and a screwdriver? What's the similarity between matches and a lamp? Okay, they've gotta be able to say uh, they're both tools. They're both providing, uh, they're both there to uh, provide light. Uh, delayed memory recall, which you did before, and then orientation of date, month, year, day, place, and city. So that's the MOCA. Uh, you add it up to a total of 30. If they get 26 or higher, they did well. Lower than 26, they have mild cognitive impairment. Uh, AV, can we switch back? Here's the cool thing. I'm not giving you any applications. That's not the cool thing. <laughs> This is a documentation course. So we got you to be able to document neurological function, but here's how you fix this. It's understanding where motor and cognition comes from. Motor and cognition is rooted in sensation. We develop embryologically sensation first, motor second, cognition third. So if you're doing sensory modalities to your patients, you're almost guaranteed to give them better motor function. And when better motor function occurs, they're going to have better cognition. So do what you do best and then just assess these things. And if you wanna figure out if you did it well, there's a little bit of statistical test that takes 15 seconds. Take a picture of it, I'm not gonna get a chance to explain it. This is called the Pocock Method. It was originally developed by a UK, a British um, statistician that needed a quick calculation to figure out if pharmaceutical trials are going off course. Meaning like this has no effect, we need to stop it, or people are getting really messed up as a consequence to these pharmaceuticals or they're getting a lot better. So you take the first event, so maybe it was your intake best, you minus the second event, which might have been your discharge best, and you divide that over the square root of the first one versus plus the second one. So a little bit of statistics, take a picture of this real quickly, if you're gonna do this. You get a number out of this called the Z-score, see Z equals that, and you put it on this chart and it tells you what your p-value is. I'm not gonna go too much into statistics here, but p-value is, tells you what probability the first and the second outcome were the same. 
Now, if you're looking at a patient trying to improve their cognitive score, and they have a 26 and a 27, and you do this calculation, and it's you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, that means the probability that they're the same is pretty high. You didn't make a change. But if the probability of the same is 0 0.0001, you could pretty much guarantee that they are different and it didn't happen by chance. So here's the, the, the summary from today, four neurological tools that we discussed. The best test for balance, king devic test for ocular motor integrity, Loria three-step test for general cognitive integrity, and the MOCA to assess for mild cognitive impairment. So I just want to thank you for your time. Thank my sponsors. Make sure you join us tomorrow for Receptor-Based Essentials. Thank you so much. Appreciate you guys. The QR code that's up there, we're all so familiar with QR code now, right? Because all the restaurants have the menus. That's my contact information. So if you scan that, it'll put my contact into your phone. And you guys can contact me with any questions. I love to help you with your patients. I guarantee you, you will not get a response from me. If you say, I have a Parkinson's patient, what should I do? Don't close the class quite yet, okay? Okay, I would love for you to say, I've got a Parkinson's patient, here's their best score, here's the MOCA score, here's the Loria test, here's their King Devic test. Is there anything that I can do for them? I'd be happy to help you. Don't waste my time, because I don't want to waste yours by telling me, I've got a concussion case, what do I do? So take my contact, visit us on the web, and I hopefully, hopefully, hopefully inspired you guys to apply some of these tests. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you, and I appreciate you guys joining us online as well, too. So, Dr. Antonucci, before we, um, before we close out the virtual, we had one question. Yeah. And that is, if, one, if someone has a deficit in the three tests, what rehab would the doctor do to help the patient? In the, the three-step test? The three tests. Because we did four tests. I think they're probably referring to the Loria three-step test. Okay, so, um, well, the short answer is come tomorrow and find out. Um, they can't. They can't. <laughs> um, so it's going to take me six hours tomorrow to explain that. So it's kind of hard to do in, in 15 seconds. You know, for now, what I would suggest to you is take these tests and have some confidence and faith in the things that you do really well. These become yardsticks to figure out if you're helping someone. You don't know what you don't know, as I said yesterday. However, now that you know how to assess these things, if you go through and do the Loria test, in something as complex, I'm not going to say as simple as an adjustment, something as complex an adjustment can radically change that three-step test. It's actually, sometimes you'll be more surprised than your patients are after you do it. So I would say, you know, for now, be okay with the answer of do what you do and it'll change the test. If you really want to learn how to be specific and uh, address those types of conditions, jump into some of the neurology classes that the FCA has to offer. I know you guys couldn't make it in person, but every single FCA event, whether it's a local event, whether it's a national event, they always have neurology courses for you to learn more. And they'll always be able to provide you information and resources for you to guys to, to learn even more if you want to do more past that. So uh, hopefully and, that helps. And they, do, and they do have that QR code right now, so they want to reach out. Yep, and well, you have the QR code now where you can get my contacts. You can always reach out to me and I can give you some direction on how to learn more about these tests and where to get some more education. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. Any questions out here? Hey, what's up, man? How are you? Good. Did you have a question about the lecture? Because I'll talk to you in a second. Okay, cool, because I want the, the streamers to hear the question. So the question was, sometimes with people with uh, different neurological conditions, imaging doesn't show anything. Does that include DTI, which is a type of a functional MRI? No, not necessarily. But here's the caveat with functional MRIs or any type of functional imaging. If I took a picture of this room 10 minutes ago, you would have saw 150, 200 people in this room. That's analogous to a functional image. It's giving you function at that point in time. However, if I take a picture of this room right now, we've got five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 people, 12 people instead of 150. So to make a deduction on brain function from an image, to me, doesn't make any sense. It's giving you function at that point in time. We love to measure function in vivo, in real life. That's why all of the tests that we do are real life tests. We use our eyes. How often does somebody sit in a brain scanner, right? So functional imaging will show 
uh, impairments uh, as far as uh, impairments for people's function or dysfunction, but realistically it may not translate to their impairments or impediments in real life? That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Reynolds was saying that with uh, personal injury stuff, when somebody's in a car accident and they have a, a brain injury, uh, that the PI litigators want to see imaging. Um, here's, here's my two cents on this. I don't do imaging. Um, I've done uh, probably about 17 depositions in the past three years. I come in with more data from the things that I do than any imaging can tell. I, sh I talk about cognitive testing, balance testing, ocular motor testing, autonomic testing, uh, hand-eye coordination. I talk about range of motion. I, and it's like, hey, all of this stuff is not this way in a normal person. So can we connect that to the accident? Well, you know what I mean? It's like if you trip off a curb and all of a sudden you got bleeding from your knee, can you connect those two things? You know, how do you know that person wasn't bleeding before? Well, it, it's kind of common sense at that point. So. You get a preponderance of data, and you know, yes, it's not an MRI, but a lot of times they, they correlate. I have Questions? Another, I have another yep. question that came in from Virtual. Have you ever have you found any correlations with these tests in children with ASD? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, autism spectrum disorder. Yeah, because these are such generic tests, and that's the reason why, that's the reason why I picked these tests out for you guys. Um, these are not specific to any one condition. And you can do them on children with autism spectrum. Now, I see a whole lot of children on the spectrum. I see a lot of people, uh, children that have cerebral palsy. I have had the fortune or misfortune, I don't know how to explain it. I've seen almost 250 kids that have drowned in swimming pools, uh, near drowning in the past uh, two years, especially because Florida and South, Car uh, South California are the two biggest places in the country for that. They can't do all of these assessments. So you gotta get creative with them. But if you have a child who's functioning the level high enough to perform them, you can certainly do them. You'll see things and you'll see them change. So yeah, absolutely apply them. Uh, autism spectrum disorders, uh, it's pretty clear through the literature that uh, with autism spectrum, one of the areas of the brain that developed a little awry is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is intimately involved in balance. I've never seen a child on the spectrum that can do a really good job at the best test. So the first test that we talked about today was really challenging for anybody on the autism spectrum. Any other questions? Cool, do you guys have another one over here? Yeah, so the question was, tomorrow in our ABCs of receptor-based essentials, the three-part program, will we be covering some things that you can do to change uh, these tests? And the answer is yes. It's not going to be a recipe. I promise you that. I don't want you to get uh, disappointed when we didn't give you a cookie cutter approach to fix this because in neurology there is no cookie cutter. I've seen, like I said, 6,000 patients. I've never done the same thing twice on 6,000 patients. So what we need to do is we need to give you the foundation of how to create treatment strategies that will work for the idiosyncrasies you see in your patient. And that's what we're going to do So the question was, will you give us protocols to help them with balance? I hate the P word. So no, I won't give you protocols. I will give you, I will give you vestibular training drills that you can apply to your patients if they have certain findings. So the way that the receptor-based essentials program works is we teach you how to identify something and then the neurological substrate behind it and what you can do to address the neurological substrate. Does that make sense? So it's connecting the dots. Yeah, it'll include exercises, yes. It will include exercises, but it will not say, hey, this person scored a 14 on their best test. You're gonna do this first, this second, this third, this fourth. That's what you can't do in neurology. And realistically, you know, you can't do it in chiropractic either, right? Sometimes you see, you know, um, the L5 subluxation and you see a C2 subluxation. Which one do you treat first? What's the protocol? Right, you take other information in, you say, hey, I'm gonna treat C2, and then sometimes what happens to L5? 
it's moving again. So there really is no protocol we can give you, but we're gonna give you the tools to be able to do that. And I hope that makes sense. That's a great question. The question was, in the Loria test, is there a time limit to do the sequencing of tasks? I don't know. I have never come across that in the literature. And in Loria's description, I didn't find it. So I would say at this point, the answer is no. There's no time limit other than what you think is reasonable and prudent. If they're like this, Yeah, you. You tell them to do it. They don't do it until you're done telling them to do it. So you're going to say, I want you to do fist, knife edge, pat. You stop and say, I want you to do that three times. Three times. You're going to do that three times. The cycle three times. They can do it on the table. They can do it on their leg. But they're basically going to do what you just demonstrated for them to do. But you don't help them through that. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. But remember, the, the grading for the Loria test is normal or abnormal. So if you saw somebody do this. Would you say that's normal or abnormal? Yeah. So that's basically what it comes down to. It comes down to, but so with the binary test, it comes down to your observation. What's that? Correct, normal or abnormal. Abnormal. Abnormal, yep. And the question was if they mess up with one of the sequences, is it considered abnormal? Yes, it's considered abnormal. The question was do I utilize laser in my office? The answer is an exclamation point yes. Um, I actually teach a whole course on uh, transcranial photobiomodulation. Uh, we use lasers like shining through people's skulls and things like that. Yeah, it's a, and it's an incredible, incredible tool. Yeah, it's an incredible tool. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to chat about that sometimes. Maybe you know, ask the FCA if they want me to put something together. I'd be happy to do you know, a little two hour thing on, on that. I use class 3B. For transcranial work, that's what I feel is the best. And in my course, I, I break down all the rationale behind that. Um, with, and I can kind of go into it for a second. The thing you don't want to do with transcranial laser, laser is generate heat. So the lower power lasers tend to work better. It's just the treatment time is a lot longer. Right? That's why you can get like a class four high power laser, pop it on somebody's knee, generating heat. You're going to address blood flow. It's not the same for brain. I mean, totally different tissues. Uh, there, you can get, if you get a change of brain tissue of 0.1 degrees Celsius, the mitochondria shuts down almost 90%. The question was, can you use a class 3B for musculoskeletal disorders? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I do. I do use it for musculoskeletal disorders as well. No, I, once again, the difference between class three and class four is power intensity, it's power density. Class fours have a greater power density. You're, you're putting out more light at the same time. But just like x-rays, light is a, is a form of radiation. It's dosed over a period of time, right? So you change your, your variables, your MAS and stuff like that on your x-ray to get more x-rays to go through them. Laser is the same exact way. So if you have a low power laser, you're just going to be doing it for a lot longer period of time to get the same amount of dose as you'll get as a class four. But yeah, I'd love to chat about this sometime. Let's talk about it. And you actually got, FCA has actually people that know more about this than I do, like Dr. Uh, Mathisi, you know, and some other guys, really brilliant in this area. And they probably know more than I do about the different classes and stuff like that. Yeah, Dr. True, absolutely. Dr. Mur Dan Murphy, you know, he's another one. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of really knowledgeable people that have really put some stock uh, behind photobiomodulation, because it works. It works. It works, you know, I, I, my opinion, it's, it works great as an adjunct. So it increases ATP, but just because you increase ATP doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get plasticity. 
question was, am I using lasers for concussion cases as well? Absolutely. I use it for every single one of my patients. Transcranially. Yep. What we like to do is we like to go through our evaluation, understand the neurology, and we use the photobiomodulation on the region of the brain that we feel is most decompensated. So if they got primarily a cerebellum problem, we'll do a posterior fossa. If they've got primarily a frontal lobe problem, we'll do it you know, specifically over the frontal lobe. If they've got like an autonomic problem with brainstem involvement, we'll do it intraorally. Um, if they got a limbic sort of concom concomitant, uh, we'll do the, like the, uh, the inferior frontal gyrus up through the nose. So yeah, we try to do it in a, a region that, of the area of the brain that uh, is most compromised. And research is showing that, that even low power lasers uh, even LEDs can penetrate up to 50 millimeters into the cerebral cortex. That's you know, almost five centimeters. So that's, that's a decent amount of size. So, um, well, so that's one of the, the question, well, what was the average time we usually do? I can answer that question, but one of the things I try to teach in my lectures is time is just a factor. What you wanna do is you wanna get the dose. So joules is the answer, what the answer would be. But average time using the laser that we use, like minute and a half, two minutes of treatment. Transcranially, yeah. And we do it twice a day. Um, so we get a little bit more frequency where somebody might want to give a little bit more dose over and space it out by a longer period of time. Yep, exactly, depending on the injury, depending on the individual. Yeah, that's why, you know, it's a very patient-centric. Yeah, no problem, guys. Any other questions online? Or are we offline already? Oh, no, just at the end of the questions. But yeah, I'll say bye-bye if there's no more questions. I don't think there are any other questions. Guys, if you have uh, just any one last questions, if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask him directly. Um, I'm looking over here. <laughs> yeah, and he, uh, he answered this one, too. We'd be giving the same lecture uh, anywhere, anywhere else in the near future, yes. Um, you will, and uh, he will be probably in 2021. <laughs> I will be. The boss says so. <laughs> what are the jewels for laser? The, is it? J U L E S. Did I pronounce it wrong? Uh, so, the 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 word that I was explaining, jewels. Uh, joule is the is a unit of measurement. It's one watt per second is a joule. It's a unit of energy. Um, I wasn't sure if they meant what are the jewels? Like what are the you know, what's so good about it? Uh, no, not J-E-W-E-L-S, J-O-U-L-E-S. Joules is a, is a uh, measurement of energy. So if you just Google what is a joule, you'll get a whole bunch of YouTube videos that talks about that. It's basically a unit that means one watt per second of energy. And that could be on, you can get a joule out of your rower, your elliptical, your laser, anything that produces energy can be measured in joules. All right, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you, and thank, appreciate the FCA.